Okay, now for our interview with Dr. Jack Sarfati. Well, we probably should start with the report and just get yeah. your, your thoughts on the report and, and then go from there. Okay, well, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? The good, the bad, and the ugly on the Pentagon uh, UAP task force report. Uh, you know, the public report, nine pages, nothing burger, which we all knew. There's nothing there. And, but what uh, we don't know about the 70 page, there's a, allegedly a classified 70 page report for the Congress with 14 videos and a, allegedly very clear pictures. So, you know, let's get right to Mike Turber, you know, when Mike Turber's been on. Yep. Uh, Mike Turber's critiques of those three public videos, even if Mike is right, it doesn't matter because that's not, you know, they, they, they even said in the report that those three videos are not their best evidence. And even Mike, Turbo can be totally correct on everything he says. I'm not saying he is or he isn't, but that's not my thing. So, um, well, hold on. Let's say I'm Mike Turbo for a second because I did want to get your thoughts on what he said on this show. And he was frankly parroting Mick West, this kind of known debunker who's yes. got some YouTube videos where it's a very simple analysis where he explains the UAP off of the East Coast, not the yep. West Coast ones, but kind of similar. So, do you? agree with that debunking that these are easily explained no let me let me let me say this that that's beyond my expertise that's beyond my competence i'm a theoretical physicist i'm not a uh, central intelligence agency photographic or video analyst you know that's tricky it's so easy I mean, you know this with cgi it's so easy to fake things so um it would take like the fbi lab or the cia a national Re reconnaissance organization you know, to really forensically look at all these videos. And, well, but, and but, but, but that video, just to be clear, the, the, the U.S. government is saying that these, the video, you know, they're, they're the ones that are saying this is video from us and that, yes, these encounters happened. Okay, so there it is. <laughs> I mean, what more do you need? I mean, my opinion doesn't matter because that's not, you know, that's not my job. That's the job of people like, you know, Bruce McAbee, Ron Pendolfi, you know, the, the, the experts, or even Mike Turber, Mike Turber, allegedly was some kind of Air Force intelligence guy. So I assume he knows what he's talking about. Um, yeah, they're just saying that at least on a couple of the videos that these movements that appear to be, you know, rapid changes in direction or rapid acceleration is actually explained by something else. And if you're looking at the video and you look at this, the, the time codes and all that. that. That may be, that may be. But my point is that uh, there's allegedly there's much better evidence otherwise you know, the military and uh, Marco, Ru Senator Rubio and uh, Harry Reid, all these guys would not take it so seriously. And uh, also, you know, I have my problems now with Christopher Mellon, as you know, <laughs> and, and with uh, Eric Davis and these guys, but um, they do, you know, they do have access to information that I don't have. And even though I disagree with them kind of politically, it's really a political ego, macho, testosterone thing with them, you know, uh, but nevertheless, um, I don't think they would be involved. And I know Hal put off since 1973. Uh, and, uh, and I know Kit Green. I, I was with Hal put off and Kit Green in London in uh, October 2017. So the fact that they take it seriously, uh, plus my own encounters as a child, you know, and I was asked by the CIA and the Defense Department to work on this problem 50, like 50 years ago, 1973. There's even some of that CIA meeting recorded on, on the internet. You can hear it, you know? So, uh, and then basically I've been working on this problem for 50 years. My professors at Cornell built the atomic bomb so that you can see why they asked me to work on it, given my academic background, you know, with Hans Bethe, who was the head of theoretical physics uh, at the Manhattan Project, stuff like that. And I've been working on it with serious people and I claim in the, in the last couple of years, we, we've solved the problem. It's an elementary problem in, phys in mainstream physics, doesn't require any new physics. It's the kind of thing where if a graduate student at Caltech or MIT was doing his PhD oral exam and the professor said, hey, look, we, we observed this, this and that, they, they gave the evidence for the Tic Tac, you know, the standard stuff about the acceleration, stuff like that. How would you explain it? They would come up, if they wanted to get, the, they would easily come up with my explanation. And also, um, 
other people are independently coming up with it. Okay, you know the idea that it's uh, that it's warp drive mm -hmm. that explain you know that explains the acceleration problem. So in any case, what I'm saying to make this simple, it's an elementary application of standard Einstein gravity physics plus modern uh solid state you know condensed the same kind of physics that they make computer chips with nanotechnology micro te technology the same kind of stuff that intel does when they're making a chip that kind of technology combined with einstein's general theory of relativity and it's an obvious it's an obvious problem so we understand or obvious solution to to yeah, a problem it, it, but, yeah but, but, but walk me through when do you say that you came up with this solution well it's been over the years the uh um, for, we were, first of all, we got several million dollars uh, from Joe Firmage. This was uh, uh, 1999 or nine, uh, 2000. Uh, he said- Several million dollars to do what? To research, to, you know, to work on the Tic Tac. They didn't call it Tic Tac, to work on UFOs. Well, and that, that's what, that was the point in my question, because for most of the public, this whole Tic Tac thing is relatively new. We, we, we no. saw these videos for the first time a couple of years ago. Uh, I think the earliest videos that we're seeing are from 2004. Yeah. So you were looking to UFOs, understand. UFOs, yeah, flying saucers. Let's okay. get it. Let's not, yeah, we, they didn't call them Tic Tacs. There were pictures, of, you know, it's been known about the, the Tic Tac shape, the long cylinder shape. That's been known for like 100 years. People reported that in the 19th century. I mean, you know, it's in the literature. There's no and, and what about exhibiting the same type of maneuverability that these yeah. guys in the military yeah. saw? Yes. Well, yes. In fact, if I think Bruce Maccabee, Bruce Maccabee wrote books about it. He was a, a, a Navy uh, physicist, optical. He, now, see, Bruce Maccabee is the kind of guy who can't evaluate the, you know, the, the videos. That's mm -hmm. what he does. He did stuff for the FBI. He consulted with Pandolfo with the Central Intelligence Agency at Langley. And he wrote a book about all this stuff, you know, like 30 years ago. So and what would be, before the Tic Tac videos, and that's, you know, I'm yeah. coming from my personal perspective, because that's when I got most involved in this. Um, before the Tic Tac videos, describe for me what were the main videos that you had seen or well, that you were asked to well, evaluate? Well, I, I never saw videos like that, but I, I, I was told about data it was, it was you know, reading reading reports jacques valet i mean th there's a tremendous literature on these observations okay plus the main thing with me is that i had a direct contact as you know with uh, what seemed to be a conscious artificial intelligence on board a, a tic tac i had my own so i had my direct i had my direct contact in 1953 which is the same time that uri geller in israel had his direct contact right around the same time and just to remind people you were young what how old were you uh, about 13 okay 13 old. people need to go back and listen to our original interview yeah, that right. they can find yeah, let's, um, yeah, let's not waste time with that but yeah. the point is i had my direct contact 1953 they told me what was going to happen in 1973 which happened that's when i met hal put off and russell targ and all the cia guys at the stanford research institute researching the uh, paranormal, you know, the regal, all that stuff, but also they were researching flying saucers. And if you listen on SoundCloud to my SoundCloud channel, you'll hear about an hour and a half, an excerpt from a much longer meeting with all these CIA, Hal Putoff guys. And we're talking about, I mentioned what happened to me as a child in 1953. This is 20 years later, okay? I mentioned that. And uh, we talked about time travel. Russell Targ talks about, yeah, we think flying saucers are coming from the future. They're coming from back from the future. Well, that's discussed up there. And that's really what I wanted to get to is, is what when you're referring to, how do you explain that? What is your theory here? What is going on that's well, connecting you know. to these things? See, I, I, I've always been kind of, you know, on the fence about this. But now with all the revelations with Tic Tac and all that, we know it's explained. I mean, what I was told in 1953 as a kid is true. That's the only way to explain it. It's time travel. They said you're going to meet them in 20 years. I met them in 20 years. But how are these these time traveling aliens? They're not aliens. They're actually okay. No, wait, let's get. They're not aliens. Let, let's get okay. this. I was told as a child that I, with these other this group of people, you know, put off all these guys, that we were going to develop the Tic Tac technology. They didn't use Tic Tacs. They called you know. It said it was a conscious computer on board a spacecraft from the future. That's what I was told as a 13-year-old kid. 
And he said, we are contacting you and a bunch of other kids, young people, because you're going to make us, you're going to build us. They're coming back. It's what, you know, it's like Terminator. It's like, a, it's like star, uh, that Star Trek where they go back in time to San Francisco to save the whales and the rockets. You know, it's it's a, what's called the loop in time. It's time travel. In other words, they're not, they're not little, they're not bugs. It's not like, uh, you know, star, starship troopers. They're not alien. They're not, they're not. They're, they're earthly. They're earthly. Well, they're our, they're, they're, well, they're, it's actually an artificial intelligence. You know, it's kind of a little bit like Terminator. But, but so yeah. an artificial intelligence created on by Earth, us. theoretically. Yeah, yeah by, by us. us. By yeah. us. I mean, or by and whoever comes in, by our group. We're, that, that we're, they, another, it, it's, it's like this time travel paradise. They're giving right. me the information to make them. With the so so it, we, we've got a lot of things that need to be understood. One, one is potentially remote viewing, and another is these UAPs and, and how yeah. they move the way they do. And the other we've just introduced is time travel. Yeah. Now, let, let me ask you about time travel for a second. From a physics perspective, is it your belief that that is possible, and do you understand it? Yes. yes. And first of all, it's not just, first of all, time travel is a big topic in major physics papers. Kip Thorne, all these guys, you know, Interstellar, you saw the movie Interstellar. Right. It's not just Jack Sarfati talking about time mm -hmm. travel, all kinds of Igor Novikov in Moscow, Kip Thorne, Caltech, lot, uh, Matt Visser, books. This is now standard physics. But inter I, in Interstellar, he's essentially traveling <clears throat> back in time. He's not traveling into the, you, what you're talking about is somebody from the future I mean, traveling that, back. In yeah. Interstellar, he travels into the future. Yeah, but he also goes back. Goes well, how does he go? How yeah, does he go back? Yeah, he goes, yeah, there's it's both, it's a loop in time. Let's not let's not get stuck okay. on, on that thing. Let me just say this there's standard physics, there are hundreds of papers being written about time travel. It's called closed time like loops, general relativity. We under conceptually, it's a piece of cake, there's no problem. Einstein's general relativity permits time travel. Now, the problem is, let me tell you what the problem is. The problem is, in order to accomplish the time travel, you need a lot of energy, too much energy, and like you know, that that's what. So that's the stuff. That, so that that's the standard narrative that time travel may be possible in principle, but it would take too much energy to do it. But that's obviously that's false. I I, I know now why that is false. We can do it with small amounts of energy. There's another thing called the uh, chronology protection conjecture by Stephen Hawking, which claims that if you were to make a time machine to go back in time, the machine will be unstable, will be in uh, what's called a blue shift and it'll blow up. But obviously uh, th that, that's wrong, that's wrong. The, the, the fact is that the physics that explains the high acceleration of the Tic Tacs that we see, that same physics is time travel physics, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, let's say on time, time travel for a second, then understanding that time travel comes into play when you're traveling at very, very high speeds. No, that's wrong. Okay. That's wrong. See, that's, that's, that's. Uh, time that's, does not slow down. Or, no, it does. But that, that's a different, there's, that, that's a, there's two different theories of relativity. There's special relativity and there's general relativity. What you're talking about is special relativity. Uh, Einstein developed special relativity in 1905. And it took him 10 years of struggle to get to general relativity uh, of, of uh, 1915, 1916, okay? Now, the, your picture in your mind of a ship moving through space close to the speed of light has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. That's, okay. not, that's not it. So that is, so yeah, so it, I thought that is kind of the interstellar well, time travel though, where, where remember yeah, in the movie, he's tra tra yeah, yeah. No, 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 he did it. He went through a wormhole, so that's different. He did. No, he went through a wormhole. But as a result, and let's just tie this off just so I'm understanding, and, and this is, you're saying this is special relativity, where he goes and he's traveling out in space and he comes back and his daughter is now 50 years old or whatever, because for him, time had slowed down. And yeah, yeah, this, okay, but, but he, he didn't get it by going fast, by going, uh, as I recall the, the script, that, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. He did not, there's gravitational time dilation as well as speed time dilation. Time dilation occurs both, you, you, you can do it either way, okay? But that's not the point. The okay. point is that uh, in warp drive, what we say, Tic Tac is not moving through space, okay? When they say the Tic Tac 
is has an acceleration of a thousand g, which is impossible, right? That's it. It's not what what the tic tac is doing. This is warp drive. In warp drive, the tic tac is controlling its own gravitational field. You know, okay. It's it's warping gravity. Is that why we call it warp drive? Gravity, uh, gravity is the curvature of space and time. Okay, it's yeah. It, Gravity itself is the warping of space and time. A warp field is a gravity field. But what the Tic Tac is doing, it is controlling the gravity field in its fuselage, that metamaterial fuselage. It's, it's, it's changing the gravitational field in its fuselage. Uh, and then in such a way that if it wants to do a maneuver, suppose it's going, if it's supposed to wants to make a right angle turn or something like that, it just, tweaks it just changes the shape of the gravitational field inside its fuselage and it like freely falls it's okay think of the space station the astronauts on board the space station right going around the earth in, in free in free orbit you know they're not firing any mm -hmm. rocket engines anything like, that, anything like that they're weightless astronauts on space station are weightless you've seen videos that they're weightless but if you measure their apparent acceleration it looks like they're accelerating very fast, but then, but of course, they're, they're zipping around the earth. They zip around the earth, so there's a centrifugal. There's a, they're accelerating. That's called kinematic acceleration. The acceleration you measure with radar, with telescopes, you know, by visual sightings. The, the acceleration you measure with with light or with the uh, infrared, the FLIR, whatever you want. Though, though, that's called kinematical acceleration. It's not the g force that's felt on board the craft. If, if it's in a warp drive mode, if it's the same. So it's now, now just, so I understand, why isn't that just explained by the fact that it's not accelerating? If I'm on a train going 50 miles no, an hour steady. No, it is, it, 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 because there are two different, people are confused. There are two different ideas of, there's two meanings to the word acceleration, okay? There's, excel, there's what's called local proper acceleration or G-force, called G-force, you know, what you feel when you're in, in your BMW convertible, they step on the gas. <laughs> you know, the G-force, okay? There's a, so that's called local proper acceleration. Then there is what's called kinematic acceleration, which is what you measure, what an outside observer using light signals, how he sees the motion, okay? So people are confusing the two accelerations. When, they, when, when, the, uh, when the military, when those UAP guys at the Pentagon, when they say, oh, they see these impossibly high accelerations, that's kinematic acceleration. But on the ship, they're not feeling anything. It's zero G-force. That's just general relativity. Okay, that's, that's what warp drive means. In warp drive, you can, you, can, uh, you can get from one place to another at what effectively is faster than the speed of light. You can... Uh, uh, it may appear that you're accelerating at very high G, but in fact, locally, there's zero G. You're weightless. Okay, it's just like the, okay, let's put it this way. It's like the guys on the space station, right? They're freely going around the orbit of the Earth, okay? But if they have a warp drive generator inside their space station, okay, then they can make the space station like a Tic Tac, and they can do anything they want. And they'll still say weightless. Even though to us on Earth, uh, the space station is, is looking is doing like tic tac type accelerations on board, they're, they're still freely floating. See, that's and, the whole point. And and how does General this and how that's would good. this technology allow you to effectively move at the speed of light? You can move at the speed of okay. <laughs> All right, this, see, or, this is, or, or or just short of the speed of light. Yeah, yeah, no, but you see, that's that's the wrong idea. That's the, you have the wrong. See, this is what's so hard. For, even by the way, it's not just you. It's the people in the Pentagon, it's the general, it's General Milley, the Joint Chiefs, all, all these people, they don't understand. They see, they don't have the big. And it's not motion through space. It's in other words, if a tic tac, you know, okay, when a rocket, when a rocket comes in to the Earth's atmosphere, there's all the re-entry problem, right? Like when the space shuttle, you have to have the heat shields and all that stuff. The tic tac doesn't do that. Tic tac just gently, you know, just enters the atmosphere, goes down or just gently goes up because it's controlling the local gravity field, okay? And it's not, okay, there's, it's not moving. Okay, there's, suppose the Tic Tac is moving through the atmosphere. There's no friction between the fuselage of the Tic Tac and the air molecules right near it. 
because the air and I, I see how that can be very important when you're close to the earth because of the gravitational pull of the earth but once you're out in space when there's very little gravity why is this technology so important because, it, because again you're because, they, because because we can get to the we can get we can get we can get to uh, to the moon and to mars you know, in a couple of minutes a couple of hours maybe so because we're, because we're controlling the, the gravity we're, we're, we're controlling our local gravitational field we generate our own gravitational field. We okay. want to get to Mars. You need a certain gravitational field to get there. We don't care about the, the, the gravitational field in space. We're controlling our gravitational field. And are you creating a strong gravitational field? Yeah. Well, I so, mean, is that what's uh, pulling you? Yes. Well, not, it's not pulling. Yeah, we're falling. We're freely floating or freely falling through the gravitational field we create right. in such a way to get us from Earth to Mars in about 15 minutes or maybe two hours. Something but, like that. But what is propelling you? Nothing's propelling. There's no propel. We're falling in a gravitational field, but we're controlling the field. Okay. And, and that's where you're, like, you're saying you're manufacturing a field to fall into. I mean, just like you fall to Earth because yes. of the Earth's gravitational pull. Right. You're manufacturing a gravitational field that is pulling you. Well, or that we're falling through. Right. We're, now, we're when we fall to Earth, we have we have a maximum speed that we hit. Well, that's irrelevant. That's because of the atmosphere. That's a secondary effect. We don't care about that. Okay, we, but how can you create a gravitational field that that could cause you to travel at the speed of light? I guess. Well, like, no, it's not. Forget the speed of light. Speed doesn't mean anything. Speed is irrelevant. Okay. Now, technically, see, I'd have to show you the math. See, the mathematics and the physics is very elementary to any first year. Uh, undergraduate at Caltech, MIT. They, they they would be understanding what you're saying right now. Absolutely, it's elementary. It's elementary. Whereas, whereas a layperson like me is struggling with it. You're you're yes, saying yes, a first year yes, physics. Yes. 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 Yeah. The thing is this. I see. I would need. Uh, I could show you on if I had a blackboard. I could show you very easily. There's what's happening. Special relativity has to do with motion through space, and there's something called a light cone, and uh, but okay. The analogy would be again with the surfer, the surf, the guy surfing a wave. Just think of the the guy surfing the wave. The surfer on the surfboard, he's the he's it, his main motion relative to the beach is because he's riding with the wave. It's the wave itself that's that's causing the main motion. He may have some small relative motion uh, uh, of the of the board of his surfboard with respect to the water, but basically. He's getting where he's going because he's like traveling with the wave on the wave. The, 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 ocean, the water wave is like space, is the warp space, okay? He's control, it's, it's like a surfer is controlling with his mind, let's say, just to make an analogy. The surf is controlling the shape of the wave. So he's able to go wherever he wants to go. He's, he, just, he just shapes the wave. He wants to go to Hawaii. He makes the wave crest go to Hawaii. From, he goes from San Diego to Hawaii riding the wave because he's controlling the shape of the wave, but he's doing it with small amounts of energy. That's like warp drive. Okay, that's a mm -hmm. metaphor for warp drive. And, and try to explain for me, therefore, how you're able to get to Mars in 15 minutes. Well, it's right there. We just go through like it's, like it's a worm. It's the same way like, like an interstellar. We could make it a wormhole with a wormhole. Okay, with, with a stargate. It's like a stargate. Okay. With a stargate, you can just imagine, okay, just imagine Doctor Who. Doctor Who with his, with his telephone booth. Remember Doctor Who? No. Just, yeah. Oh, you never <laughs> saw Doctor Who? British, oh, you should see that. It's okay. a very popular British sci-fi comedy you know, thing. He's a time traveler. He's a lord of time. Okay. okay. But, uh, you can have a doorway. You can just have a doorway. And on, on one side of the door is Earth. On the other side of the door is Mars. And you just open the door, you walk right through, and there you are. You're there actually instantly. That's possible in general relativity. And in fact, I think you know that technology actually exists. That's that's how that's how even alien, you know, real aliens, the little green men or the grays, all that stuff, they can get here through through what's called stargates. And that's all the stargate technology, the tic tac warp propulsion technology. It's all the same thing. It's all Einstein's general theory of relativity of 1916. And it's just an application of his field equation combined with uh, modern quantum mechanics and solid state physics. It's okay, let me ask you a question then about these, these tic tacs that have been observed. So under the theory that you're uh, putting forth here, 
It's these not a things. theory. I'm, 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 it's or an explanation, a, it's, we should say. Yeah, it's, it's an, an explanation. explanation. But it's an explanation that comes from battle-tested, experimental, confirmed, standard textbook physics. It's not string theory. It's not some crazy... Okay, so then do these Tic Tacs come via time travel or via, yes. via yes. traveling at, at, at this warp speed? It's almost the same. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's the same mechanism. They can, they can come with warp drive. You, you can go anywhere in space or almost anywhere in time you want. It's the same physics. It's space and time are unified. It's space time. It's not space and time. It's space time. That's a, and you're, you're manipulating the shape of space time itself, but you're doing it with small amounts of energy. See, that's the key. The key is that you don't need a lot of energy. To so are you, are you saying, and again, this is layperson questions, but it's good because most people are lay people. Yeah. Yeah. If you're talking about me being able to travel to Mars in 15 minutes, then or maybe, maybe in two seconds, in two maybe seconds, door. but I'm not traveling back in time to Mars. I'm just traveling to Mars in two seconds. No, no, you, you, you could, you, you, it's up to you. It depends on how you design the Stargate. You can go back in time or you go forward in time or you go at the same time, whatever you want to do. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant I mean, to ask this question, but but try to explain to me in lay, lay terms how I could travel to Mars and go back in time. Because <laughs> I'd have to show you, that's, that, that's called the war. I mean, I have to show you a space-time diary. I mean, I, you, you just have to take my word for it because unless I had visuals, I mean, there were visuals. I actually have some visuals I could show you, but- But you know, all of it is a combination of travel and time is that correct that the no, only way to go forward is, or back in time in, involves some form of travel well it depends how you define travel the point yeah you, you know what you do with the you can go any way you want they're called world lines in space time you can you can you can shape your own world the, the shape of the world line the the path you decide to take depends upon the gravitational field okay your local gravitational field. So if you can control the gravitational field, you can go anywhere you want in space and time. The problem is how do you do it without needing a lot of energy? And that's the problem that I claim we have basically solved. That's where the metamaterials come in. You know, you hear okay. Elizondo talks about metamaterials. So let's just summarize this thing. You're gonna have to take my word for it. It's elementary physics, okay? And what I'm saying is what angers me about the UAP, let's get back to the UAP report. What angers me about Louis Elizondo and Chris Mellon and Colonel John Alexander and all these guys, when they get on Tucker Carlson or even Nick Pope, who doesn't know what he's talking about, you know, he doesn't know any theory. You know, he's just a, a, a guy who was tasked to do this. Nick Pope, like Elizondo, same sort of thing. And and they say, oh, we don't understand it. It's beyond our, our understanding, it's beyond their understanding, because they don't know any physics. But to any competent physicist, they can understand what's going on. It's an elementary application of known principles, laws of physics. It's so if these things are real, what we're observing in these videos and what Fravor the pilot saw and other yeah. pilots have seen, you're saying, if these things are real, which still, frankly, is a question, and I think even you take well, the question. Well, no, at this point, let's put it this way, you know, everything, my estimate of the probability that they're real is like 90%. You know, it's, it's, we, we don't, never know for sure. Be, be, because they're so easily explained, right? Yes. That's why you're saying it's 90%. Yeah. If, if, if there's no explanation for it, then you start to wonder, well, was yeah, okay, this really what they thought stupid. it was? Okay, see, that's stupid. Anybody who tells you that is stupid. They don't know what they're talking about. It's not true. It's false. False information. It's fake news. It's fake but, but, news. but what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's theoretically possible, but it hasn't actually been achieved no. on earth to, to date as no. far as we know no 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 i don't know no no it, it's achieved because we're seeing it that's what the navy's seeing maybe maybe did the u.s navy achieve it maybe not i don't know did vladimir putin achieve it maybe he did see there's now there's another thing that's that, that i gotta say here that's important i think we, we touched on it the last time the russians have been tracking my work for years ever actually ever since the 70s and by the way, when we say it's your work, is it your work and others, or is it just you? Basically my, it's my work that I've been helped now by others. I've been basically working alone and fighting people like Hal Portoff and Eric Davis with their own kooky theories. Which but, it, but, but, but who has reviewed your work and said that, yeah, Jack, you've got it 
Correct. Well, Professor Keith Wanzer, for example, Professor at Cal State Fullerton, you know, he's actually working on it. He sees, he, he understands what I'm saying. Okay. He understands it. Okay. And uh, the guys in Italy, the guys in uh, London, there's a guy named Maurice Passman. He's a PhD physicist from the University of London who worked at the Ministry of Defense for like seven years on the important, you know, on, on important stuff. He understands this. There's an Israeli guy, Arik Shemansky. There's a bunch of people who understand the idea of this guy named Larry Lemke, who basically understands he was- And, and, where, and where have you put this idea in a way that, you, you know, physics I, uh, I put experts it, I put would-, it, would I, put it, I put it on many videos on YouTube and Vimeo, on uh, papers, on academia edu. Now, the thing is this, you cannot publish this stuff in peer reviewed journals because they think it's crazy because they're all stupid about this. They're all, you know, the woo woo factor. Physical review, physical review will not publish papers on this kind of stuff. There are these specialized journals. But like you that. have written a paper on it. I've written a lot of papers. It's just not in a peer reviewed journal. Because there are no peers. There's no peer right. review. Right. But, but, but what would be the paper that you would point people to? What would be the primary paper you would point people to? Uh, right now, uh, because you know, I'm not an I, I quit academia like oh, but for like 50 years ago, I quit academia when the CIA and those guys asked me to work on this problem. I quit academia. Okay, I'm not. You know, I'm I, I'm, in, I'm independently funded to work on this. Okay, and uh, so Keith Wanzer, who's a almost retired now, almost emeritus, he had another year to go. He is still in academia, and he is you know slowly writing up a paper. But the thing is. Things are changing so rapidly. We're making so much progress. It's very hard to write. As soon as you write a paper, it's obsolete. We have we we found out something new. See what I mean? The the rate of so the point is papers don't matter anymore. Papers don't matter. We have the internet. We have instant communication with the internet. Now let me say this: the Russians are already working on this. The Russians, yeah, we went into this. the Russians came and videoed me twice back when Obama was president, okay? The real breakthrough came to me around 2011 when I gave this paper at a DARPA NASA meeting in Orlando, Florida, as a whole thing. I had part of the idea. And so there were Russians at that meeting. And uh, the, uh, we, I've been involved with uh, Russian physicists on several levels uh, since, um, well, since I was at Trieste in 1973, <laughs> Trieste, right? I met all these Russians. I was even went into uh, into Eastern Europe. You know, I, I was at the Ljubljana. And, I mean, Tito was st Tito was still the, the head of Yugoslavia. It was Yugoslavia. I was in Ljubljana at the Nuclear Institute. It was all KGB, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> and that was partly as just a CIA thing. I mean, I volunteered for the CIA in 1963, a few weeks after the JFK assassination. Okay, I went. To, I mean, I was very patriotic. I was working at Fort Philco Aeronutronics, Newport Beach. You've been Newport Beach in 1963. I had a Jaguar XK150. Wow. Used to go out with uh, used to go out with the Hollywood starlets at the Beverly Wilshire stuff like that. In any case, so I was Newport Beach 85 to 89. By the way. Yeah, well, I was there like uh, 63, 64, <laughs> okay. I, I had a place in Laguna Niguel, I also had a place, lived on Balboa Island, you know, you know, the whole scene. Love the island, yep. Okay, so, but in any case, I'm at Ford Philco Aeronutronic, J JFK's assassinated, you know, everybody was really patriotic then, and, you know, I'm working for a defense contractor, okay. And uh, so I uh, contacted the C, I, I, I went to a CIA office. It was right near UCLA in Westwood, California. It was there for about four or five hours. This one guy, a whole bank of tape recorders, and I forget exactly. You know, this is like, and I, you know, I wanted to be like James Bond. Okay, <laughs> I'm 23 years old, 24 years old. All right. So, um, so that's ab that, that's obviously relevant to to what's going on now because this whole thing, me going, being called to go to Europe, was part of the CIA thing, and we now know that. Uh, that the whole project at Stanford Research Institute was a CIA project. Plus, I met a whole bunch of CIA guys who told me about it later on. A guy named Harold Chipman and you know other people. But and also, if you read the book by How the Hippies Save Physics by MIT professor David Kaiser, he talks about the CIA involvement in all this stuff in, in the 70s. So I was what's called a um, what do you call it? pawn, a useful idiot, whatever, of the CIA. 
for years. I mean, oh, let's say an asset. I'm not an asset of the CIA because, and that makes sense because my professors, remember, my professors built the atomic bomb, went to an Ivy League school, Cornell. You know, so so it all it all fits together. All right. So, uh, but the point is, the Russians are are smart. Okay, the Russians know about all this because I was also, as you know, I was involved uh, with the Institute for Contemporary Studies helping Reagan formulate the Strategic Defense Initiative. And we also had contacts with the Russians at that time. The Russians were at Esalen. So there's been this communication. The Russians are very aware of me. I mean, and, and they've been tracking my work. So we have to assume that they are working on my uh, approach, okay? I, I think I've also heard you say that in order to accomplish this, we're talking about billions of dollars in many, many years and in a huge team of men, correct? Well, that's what, you know, that's what I, I mean, I could be wrong about that. That's my current estimate. Unless, unless there are retrieved, you know, crash craft with the metamaterials and just analyze those. And that's what's supposed to be Hal Puthoff's job. Allegedly, you know, Hal Puthoff works with Senator Harry Reid. Now the Democrats are back in power, right? They have, and Christopher Mellon, you know, they're, they're supposed to have access to that. All right, so I don't know. So, you know, under those conditions, maybe we can do it in six months, you see what I'm saying, with modern techniques. And what, what, what crashes are you aware of? I'm not aware of any. All I know is rumors, okay? All I know is, you know, when we were working with, uh, uh, I don't have security clearance like that, but when we were working at Joe Firmage's place 20 years ago, we had several million dollars to investigate all this, where there were various guys that we were working with who claimed to have know about that. Whether mm -hmm. You know, I don't know because I didn't see it myself. Mm -hmm. right. And the craft that has been observed, to go back to what we we're talking about, it could come from the future or it could come uh, interstellar from some other um, intelligent could, life, okay. right? Okay, the, it could, yes, both, both are possible. But the thing is, the iron post of observation that I had was what happened to me as a kid where they said, so we know that some of them are coming from the future because the physics um, doing creates that technology. And the physics, you know, presumably is because, you know, I'm getting the physics because they're telling me it's the physics, you know, through what, subconscious telepathy. Well, okay, but the other thing is that uh, if you listen to the uh, CIA recording of 1973 at Stanford Research Institute, I talk about, I got that one phone call as a 13 year old kid, okay? I talk about one phone call in 1973 but later on, it turns out my mother remembered I got three weeks of such phone calls, of which I have no memory. So I have like, okay, there were three, three weeks of phone calls. And my mother finally got worried and she grabbed the phone and told him not to call anymore, you know, Jewish mother from Brooklyn. So, but the thing is this, I have no memory of those three, three, three weeks of phone calls that my mother has. So maybe God knows what they were doing to me. They were in, you know, implanting the information that would come out later on. Oh, by the way, there's a mechanism that's called, what's called temporal, it's called einstein Podolsky uh, entanglement signaling across time. There's entanglement signaling across space, but this is entanglement signaling across time. And so, in fact, there have been experiments where uh, certain information can be implanted in the brain and that information will only become conscious at some time in the future that can be predetermined. There have actually been experiments showing this, at least for, well, maybe not for brains, but for simple atomic systems. So, um, and, yeah, and what about, what, what is the scientific explanation for telepathy? It's, it's very simple, I'm just saying, okay. It's 1975. Was it 19, yeah, no, no, it's early 1976. Maybe it's late, late 1975. It's a guy named George Koopman. George Koopman was an army uh, intelligence guy, okay? And he, we were down at Esalen. George Koopman appears, I had this group, I, I was being funded. This is what, uh, we, we had this, this place up on, uh, on uh, Knob Hill funded by Lawrence Rockefeller's uh, girlfriend at the time. Yeah, we were given money to work on this problem. George Koopman shows up and he starts giving us money too. We, we were getting money from the Army Tank Command and the US Air Force, you know, work on UFOs, stuff like that. And I'm, I'm, uh, we're in, the, we're in the, the office up on Knob Hill there, right across from the Grace Cathedral. 
and George, uh, I'm there, Fred, I think Fred Wolf was there, and a guy named Saul Paul Sarag, my assistant was there. And George Koopman says, there are two things the CIA wants to know. How do flying saucers fly and how does consciousness work? In terms of physics, plus Werner Erhard was giving me money. You know, this is all in the book, How the Hippies Save Physics. The Physics Consciousness Research Group, we were funded by Lawrence Rockefeller, by Werner Erhard, by the army, by the defense department. You know? <laughs> what about the Scientologists? Uh, what's the guy's name? Oh yeah, L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard, this sounds uh, right, right in his- Oh, well, Werner uh, Erhard was connected with L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah, there are connections to that too. But but in terms of, we were, we were like given resources, how do flying sources fly? How does consciousness work, okay? Plus this is when I was also working with Hal Putoff and Russell Tog at the remote viewing we were doing with Elizabeth Roush. We, you know, we were doing experiments, remote viewing experiments. We are paid to do all this by guys like Lawrence Rockefeller, okay? <laughs> Sorry, this is, this is serious stuff. He's as important as Harry Reid, right, back then. So um, in any case, yeah, so now we solve the problem. I'm telling you and I'm telling the world, I'm telling anybody who's listening, I was asked by the CIA and Defense Army people to work on this years ago. We've been working on it for like half a century and we've solved both problems. We understand how consciousness works in terms of elementary physics, quantum mechanics, what's called post-quantum mechanics. We understand how UFOs fly. We understand the Tic Tac. We understand it all. It's not difficult. Anybody who tells you we, it's beyond our understanding. Well, they're idiots. See, it's beyond their understanding, not beyond our understanding. We have solved the problem. Mission accomplished. We have solved the problem that the Central Intelligence Agency asked us to work on 50 years ago. We've solved it, and there are other scientists working with me. International group, France, Italy, England, USA, who understand what I'm talking about. And, so, and what was solved when we talk about consciousness? We understand what you have to do to how to make, we, I can make a conscious computer. I can make a, a chip and then you know, in print, I mean, I, could, I, I sort of know how to, you know, I, I'd have to work with Intel engineers and Apple engineers, stuff like that with a group. But we understand in principle how to make a computer chip that'll be as conscious as you and me. And how, kind of, it's very and, how, and how do we do that? <laughs> well, that's a whole <laughs> again. You know, you're asking me. Is uh, that is that back to metamaterials? Actually, yes. Actually, it turns out it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's good. It turns out that we are made of metamaterials. We are natural metamaterials. This gets to a guy named Stuart Hameroff, who I sometimes have ego battles with. But Stuart Hameroff is a um, he's a anesthesiologist at the University of Arizona. And he also is working with a top physicist named Roger Penrose, who I actually took courses with in England. Uh, and they, uh, Stuart Hameroff has a theory, or uh, not a, a conjecture, that our consciousness is generated inside the microtubules that are in all our cells, especially our nerve cells. Microtube. Now it turns out what a microtubule is, it's a, it's a natural metamaterial, it's an organic metamaterial. Okay, so, uh, so, and, and I think Stuart Hameroff's uh, basic idea is correct. It's consistent with what I'm saying, although the, we have certain disputes on, on uh, Roger Penrose's gravitational collapse and stuff like that. I don't need that. But basically, um, the Penrose, the uh, Hameroff idea is basically correct and it fits, and I'm able to explain using just quantum mechanics. What, 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 um, <laughs> there's a whole story. I don't know if we have time. There is a, there is a, a theory of quantum mechanics due to David Bohm. David Bohm worked with Albert Einstein in Princeton. Again, 1952, 1953, the same time that I'm getting my phone calls, okay? David Bohm has a theory. It basically explains the mind-matter interaction, okay? And using David Bohm's theory, I'm able to explain consciousness in the following, roughly in the following way. In quantum mechanics, we have what are called quantum waves. You've heard of wave particle duality, right? So the quantum waves, these quantum waves, they are physically real mental fields or proto proto mental fields. What 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 is what are you? What is Jim Breslow? You want to know what you really are? Jim Breslow 
what, what is Jim Breslow's mind? Jim Breslow's, Breslow's mind is a giant coherent quantum mechanical wave function that's connected to all the microtubules in his brain. It's a field. It's a physical field. It's a quant what's called a quantum, a qubit, quantum information field. That's what your mind is. Okay. And then there are the, in the microtubules are these electrons. There's electro electrons inside these microtubules. And the electrons are coupled. So you have, for example, electromagnetic signals are coming into Jim Breslow's eyes, right? They're coming, those signals, electromagnetic fields are coming into those signals. It's being processed, you know, neuro neuroscience. It's being processed. That, in, that information, electromagnetic signal information is being processed and it gets down to the microtubules, okay? And it gets down to, it starts jiggling the electrons, starts jiggling the electrons in the microtubules, you know, in a, in a patterned way, right? In a patterned way. And then those, those jiggling electrons in your microtubules, they push on, they react on this coherent mind field, this quantum wave function. And they induce like little ripples, like little, it's like throwing a stone into a pond, right? They induce patterns in the mental, in, in, in the quantum wave function. And those patterns, that's your consciousness. That's, that's, what, that's your experience. That's it. It's very simple. It's very simple. And now the point is we can do this in the lab. We can make this, we can make artificial microtubules that are called quantum dot networks. We can make them in the nanotech lab and we can actually test, we can actually make a conscious computer chip. So that- so we, we can make AI with consciousness. Is what you're yes, saying. AI with consciousness. That's, right. And that's who contacted me in 1953. And it was a conscious AI. And by the way, how do we know that we are not conscious AI? Well, we you are. And I, you and I. You just answered the question. Of course, that's what we are. That's what we are. It's okay. simple. Created, okay. created by? Oh, well, okay, you want to get, well, that's, okay, that's a whole, uh, all right, now you want to get into religion. Now you're, you're gonna, uh, yeah, we're created from the future too. We're, it's all a loop, everything, everything's created, for, it's all what's called a, a loop in time. It's all like in Terminator, or it's like in, in Interstellar, these are all like, uh, in fact, there's a, there's a physicist in Moscow named Igor Novikov. Igor Novikov works with Kip Thorne. Kip Thorne's the guy who did the special effects for Interstellar. Okay, Caltech professor, used to work with John Wheel. Okay, Novikov has written books called The River of Time. He explains all this, how it, this all happens. These are called self-consistent loops in time. Okay. And for, and for the novices such as me, how does Big Bang fit into that? It fits, there's nothing. Uh-oh, hold on, hold on. Yeah. So, sorry, sorry, uh, you, you froze on me. It, it fits okay. in how? Uh, it says, how, how does Big Bang? Oh, are you okay? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? The Big Bang is ignited and designed from the future in such a way that it's going to come into that everything is going to come into existence. It's a self-consistent loop in time. The fluctuations in the Big Bang are mani being manipulated back from the future. There's something called there's something yeah you, know, you have now we have to we're covering a lot of ground. There's something called the future event horizon. There's a, there's a cosmic future event horizon. It's, it's a kind of, uh, it's a kind of two dimensional membrane in, sp in, in space that is actually itself a computer. It's computing. There's a guy named, uh, oh, in fact, there's a guy named Seth Lloyd. There's a guy named Seth Lloyd. He was a professor at MIT. He got involved, unfortunately, with, with Epstein, with Jer 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 Epstein, and he was fired or let go from his job at MIT. He's a brilliant, you know, I mean, he didn't do anything bad. He's just, you know, he took money from Jeff Epstein, as did a lot of people. Stephen Hawking took money. I mean, uh, you know, all these, a lot of physicists took money. So I think Epstein got, I, I think uh, Seth Lloyd got a raw deal. But in any case, Seth Lloyd has published papers. It's been in Scientific American about the black hole horizon being a, compu a computer, that uh, there is a natural conscious computer structure in space-time itself, in cosmology, it's called the future horizon, and that's that's the cosmic intelligence. It's like intelligent design. That's the cosmic intelligence which is creating us. I mean, what 
but, yeah. but but you do you do believe humans evolved from single cells in the ocean that eventually yeah. crawled out of the ocean and all that uh, yeah but that was all done by design so the, the thing you know all that the single cells are all being designed back from it's all, i mean it, it doesn't seem like a design i mean if you if you just go with darwin's type evolution where you know survival of the fittest and so on that survival of the fittest doesn't sound like design to me no wait a minute it's both they're not they're not inconsistent they're not inconsistent in fact uh, uh, a physicist named Fred Fred Hoyle from Cambridge wrote a book called The Intelligent Universe. He describes everything you're talking about. How to understand? You have both happen in the lab. Yes, Darwinian natural selection happens. In, you can see it in the lab with Drosophila stuff like that. Nobody's denying natural selection, but what's happening with us is unnatural. This, this natural selection that's being tweaked. That's being tweaked. It's both natural selection and and manipulation. Be, being tweaked how from the future by time travelers coming back the garden of eden what's the garden of eden these biblical stories have some truth in them some literal truth in the garden of eden what happened was a tic tac you know, came back took primitive humans did a little genetic engineering crisp you know crispr technology we know how to do it ourselves now right this is not mysterious they manipulated the dna code and made us more conscious made us more intelligent you, you know, believe that you believe that happened Yes. Our, our, our intelligence is not simply a, a function of evolution. It depends what you mean by evolution. It's not, not well, the most standard Dar Darwin evolution that people. No, no, that, that happens. That's a, that's a factor. It's multiple causes, not just one or the other. It's not a zero sum game. You have natural selection and you also have interference from the future. You have both. So, you know, there are these. And what is the, what is the, sorry, what is the evidence of the interference from the future? Because we well, the the evidence of the interference from the future is that suddenly, when did we start? When is a recorded history? Five thousand years, six thousand years. Language. Okay. When did language happen? About then, right? Okay. Suddenly, language happened. How did that happen? Why? Well, Why suddenly? Eventually, uh, it was invented like a like the computer was invented. No, but that's not that's, that's nonsense. If you go back and see, there are all these legends, the sky gods. It's all there, and then you know you go back. Both sky gods, all ETs coming down, and you know, uh, uh, th there's so much literature on this. I mean, uh, this is not just me. This is you know because no, the they had nothing else to do but stare up at the sky at night. It got uh, there's no light, but, so no, uh, yeah, no, no. Dark. What I'm saying, the sudden appearance of language and written language is, is itself evidence of um, manipulation, genetic engineering from the future time travelers. Plus, I was told, I, I mean, I, I met them myself, okay? You, know? so, you were a kid, though. Yeah, so what? I was a smart kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, kids, kids can be fooled by... Uh... Yes. It, okay. By, yes. by the neighbor kid, or uh... no, 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 they couldn't because I was I was the gang leader. I was the smartest kid on the block. <laughs> nobody, okay. none of the kids. Nobody could well, fool you. Now, and also, they couldn't make cold metallic voices. How are they going to make that? How are they going to do that? There's a cold metallic voice on the phone. It was not like it was like Stephen Hawking's voice. Remember how you know Stephen Hawking, the physicist. Yeah, the but you but you know you only remember one of these uh, calls when your mom yeah. said there was multiple. Yeah, so we, weeks of them. Hours, many hours, walking around glassy eyed. But, but 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 if if you only remember one, then doesn't that call into question even the one? Because how come you not? No, because my mom spoke to them. She grabbed the phone and, and heard the voice. No, oh, but get mom on the show. Where's mom? No, mom died. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm 82 years old. My mother was 106. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But but uh, no, there are witnesses to that uh, Kimber Afado. Uh, their witnesses, my mother told the story to other people. And my mother's a very literal, she's a Jewish mother from Brooklyn, for Christ's sake. You know, she's not going to make up stories like that about her son. But you, 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 your theories are not all dependent on what happened to you as a kid, though. No, of course not. Obviously not. I'm a PhD from <laughs> you know, Cornell University of California. Okay. Have, yeah. have you ever met someone who claims to have had a very similar experience to you as far as the, the type uh, yes, of phone call you yes. got? Now, apparently, yes, I have met a few people who claim to. And if you listen to the CIA recording, I believe it's on that excerpt, Brendan O'Regan says they have said data of several hundred incidents like that. I'm not the only one. Of course not. Mm. And, and, and just to remind people, the primary thing that was said to you th that you recall that's of significance was what? Number one, they wanted me to develop their technology. That's number two. And if I would do that, if I would agree, I would begin to meet the others who I'd be working with in 20 years, which was 1973, which is when I met 
how put up Russell Todd. Jacques Vallée was supposed to be there. He didn't. He actually arranged a meeting. Brendan O'Regan, Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut, and a whole bunch of other people. Okay. And so he, far, you've you've let them down because you haven't created it yet. What's taking you so long? Right. You're eight, you're 81 years old, and you still haven't done it. No, I have done it. I, no, you have to understand. I have done it. Jack Sarfati's done it. Understand something. Jack Sarfati is a theoretical physicist, like Einstein or you know, Feynman. Jack Sarfati, what theoretical physicists do, they write on pencil and paper now in computers, they write mathematical equations that, current, that explain the phenomena. So I've done my job to do an experiment. You're talking millions. I mean, the, the cheapest experiment these days yeah, it requires a lot of research, a lot of money. Okay. I've done, I've been given some money. I've been given enough money to be an independent researcher and do what I'm doing. You know. So you're, you're, and I kind of remember this, this from the last year, you're, you're trying to get people's attention to say, guys, here it is. Start the experiments, right? Spend the money, start the program. Yeah. And, and the Russians, I think, are already doing it. Maybe the Chinese. Oh, and one other thing I should mention there were several hundred Iranian engineers, physicists, who track my work on social networks, uh, uh, link, LinkedIn, you know, link, LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Got, LinkedIn, yeah. I have, uh, I, I think as many as 300 now. I have, I've lost count. There's a lot of them. I, I have like 65, I have almost, I have 65, 6,500, uh, you know, Connections. followers on LinkedIn. And about three or 400 of them are from Iran, Tehran. They're engineers, they're physicists. Uh, people in the CIA know say that some of them are uh, uh, Iranian intelligence agents, stuff like that. So uh, Tehran, they don't have many resources, but they have smart people there. Their physicists are just as good as our physicists. Okay, so I know they're interested, and I know the Russians are interested. I, I have definitely also I'm able to track people who monitor my work. There's a I've what about like, the big three: Bezos, Musk, and, and, and Branson. Are they interested? Well, somebody who claimed to be Branson got in touch with me not, not too long ago, but I haven't heard any follow-up. The problem is, okay, Bezos, Musk, these are all genius guys, okay? But they're all e egomaniacs as well. You have to be in order to be like, you know, they're, 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 and, and uh, they have too much of their own ego invested in obsolete firecrackers, Chinese fire, uh, uh, you know, rockets, rocket technology. So, and... If I could get into a room with Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or Richard Branson, if I got in, if I was able to do a Zoom thing like you and me, I could sell them on it in probably in 30 minutes because they're not stupid. Okay. And I would have, have this guy, Keith Wands, I have a few other physicists with me, and we could sell them on it. They're wasting all their money. Mm. Plus, they, could, Jeff they, Bezos, they could throw a billion dollars at this very easily. They could throw 10 billion. They could throw 10 billion. But I think. I was told Vladimir Putin is personally interested in what I'm doing. I was told by, by a Russian, okay? And I don't know if it's true. But that's what I was told. Said, but the Russians well, probably have less money than, well, Putin, I guess, has a lot no, of money. No, no, Putin has $160 billion. Years ago, he had $160 allegedly. If his own, you know, that he, whatever he stole, whatever he has, he, he has access to $160 billion. He, Putin has as much money as Jeff Bezos, probably, maybe more, okay? And the Russians, they don't need me. I publish all my stuff. The Russians know what I'm thinking. They had very, we had a couple of Russian physicists working with us from Moscow at, back at, at Joe Fermage's place, you know, in the year 1999. We, had, we were communicating with the Russians back then. Well, the Russians take my stuff seriously. You know, I have uh, 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 problems with, uh, with Colonel Alexander and Eric Davis and people like that who are trying to sell their own nonsense to the government. So they're trying to, you know, suppress. But meantime, the Russians are working on it. They're have you heard of X Prize? Yes. Yeah, I'm just X Prize is coming to mind. We we interviewed the CEO yeah. of, of X yeah. Prize. Well, and... The thing is, the thing I think I met one of those guys. Is it is that Peter Diamandis? Yes. Okay, Peter's he's an asshole. <laughs> Sorry, I don't you said it, not me. Yeah. I I know Peter and I were on the same committee for the hundred year Starship. I met him personally back in 2010. So, uh, General Pete Warden, head of NASA, former head of a uh, Navy uh, Space Command. There was a meeting of 30 of us. At this uh, at this camp, this uh, army camp uh, in um, in Marin County, and I spent about two or three days. Peter Diamandis was on the committee with me and other people. By the way, I got to tell you, Jack, you are amazing with names. Yeah. Because 
I, I was struggling to come up with that name, and I've, I've worked with that group, and you, you come up with these names. Well, so yeah, I'm, I'm like Zelig. I'm like, I'm <laughs> <the> Zelig. <laughs> Did you ever see Woody Allen movie Zelig? Yeah, I'm yeah. Call. So, so, so what, real quick, and then we'll wrap up. What, what, what was your interaction with Peter? Peter, he's got his own trip. I don't know. I, I, I sort of got, maybe he, he's on his own trip, and he's kind of a, you know, he, he's a salesman. He's a he doesn't know anything. Mm. He doesn't know well, he did an amazing job getting that set up, uh, yeah, yeah. nonetheless. And um, in yeah. fact, in fact, I think they get credited for some of the. Uh, I, I think what Branson ended up buying was a function of X Prize because there was a prize to go into space and return and yeah, do it but twice. It's all stupid. It's like a, they're like a you know Polish jokes. It's also they're all doing primitive rockets forget rockets but that but that's know. that's my that was my point in thinking about x prize that maybe they ought to create an x prize to deliver on what you're you know proving your principle or, yeah. or yeah. okay yeah but but the point is they're not getting they're not talking the only way they can do that is if they talk to me directly and if they talk to keith wands and other people i'm working with by the way i'm supposed to, i'm supposed to have a meeting in rome with the italian military in rome if i can get there at the end of the year, that, well, I know uh, a couple of people at XPRIZE, so I can I can see if if they're interested in yeah. talking. Well, and that's I, why I go back to what what would be the what would be the primary thing also that I could send them to read. No, you should send the videos. You know, the videos I have up on Vimeo. The video is much better than anything to read. The videos are I have some really good videos here. I'll send I'll I'll get I'll resend you the links. Just have them look at the videos. We have some great videos, and also I have uh, the, one of the videos is like a slideshow with the lectures with the technology, you know, with the equations. But the thing is, I doubt they're going to do it because you know they're probably judging. You know, they're probably you know UFOs is crazy. Well, maybe not now because of the Pentagon. Maybe well, not. also the, the way you're explaining, the amount of dollars are not going to work because you know they'll come up with a prize that's you know I don't know. I'm mean, best case is like. Hundred million dollars or a prize or something. Well, hundred million, million something with a hundred million. Yeah. Well, the whole idea is that people chase this prize. So a lot more than if the prize is fifty million, five hundred million will be spent by various entities trying to get this fifty million dollar prize. That's the the geniusness of, of, yeah, of X Prize. Yeah, yeah. But but I thought you you I thought you're putting this more in the billions. I don't know. I don't know. All I know is that we need we need more money than we have now. I don't know. I don't. It, it could. You know, well, somebody, there could just be a step one. Okay, let me tell you what the problem is. The problem is we have to find the right meta material. Okay. So, of, so that could oh, be the, the, the X Prize could be for finding this meta material. Yeah, but the, how do you find the meta material? See, there's a lot of papers. If you go online now, there's hundreds of people working on meta material. Somebody may all may have found it by accident. Okay. What's, a, what's an example of a meta material that's out there right now? I mean, do, do, is a computer chip meta material? No, not really. No, they're using metamaterial for cloaking. There's all kinds of, they use for antennas. There's all kinds of applications of metamaterials. I mean, it, 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 just just go on Wikipedia, just Google it. You'll see there's a, there's a lot of stuff. There are metamaterials, there are acoustic metamaterials for sound waves. There are metamaterials for microwaves. There are metamaterials for light. There's, uh, yeah, there's, all, there's all kinds of, uh, but the point is uh, a lot of this metamaterial work, it's done what's called far field work where the, you actually have electromagnetic fields of sound waves moving through the metamaterial. We are interested in what are called near field, where they're not actually waves moving through the material. They're like static, electric, slowly changing electric fields and magnetic fields in, confined inside the metamaterial. So there's some differences. The, the near field metamaterial work is, there's not too much of that. That's what we have to develop. But also in doing metamaterial research, there are two things you have to do. You have to first do a computer simulation. You design, it's like designing a molecule, you know, quantum chemistry. Uh, you, you have to design theoretically what are these artificial, what is a metamaterial? It's artificial atoms. You make these, what are called meta atoms. You have, to, you have to design those. Those are like tiny little things. So you have to design that with the quantum mechanics with theory. And you have to put them together in a lattice structure. Actually, you want to do what are called two meta surfaces. The two, they're like graphene, it's like sort of like graphene type things, two dimensional layers. And so you want to design that theoretically. So that takes a lot of theoretical work with, you know, scientific programmers. That's a whole theoretical effort. And you don't, and then once you have a theoretical design on the computer, then you go into the lab and try to manufacture it. You know, with Intel techniques or 
various techniques of doing so it. So step one is the theoretical design, and that's all just computer work. That's all ma mainly computer yeah. work. And so by the maybe way, maybe that's the X prize. Yeah, oh, oh, what? It, oh, they have. They're developing artificial intelligence algorithms that are designing the metamaterials. Because it's so complicated that humans, you know, I, Jack Sarfati can't sit down and sort of like right. think. Yeah. So, so, so the first effort, and that doesn't take that much, but that would be, you know, 100 million to be able to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool. All right, my friend. Well, I think this was better than Coast to Coast. What do you think? Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you again to our guest, Dr. Jack Sarfati. Thank you to Michael Parker, our producer. Thank you all for listening. We'll be back soon with another episode of The Hidden Truth Show. Thank you for listening to The Hidden Truth Show with Jim Breslow. You can find us at hiddentruthshow.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Truth Show. Join us again next week another episode of Hidden Truth Show with Jim Russell.